Military Justice and the Rules of Engagement in an Era of Irregular Conflict A 30-minute presentation held in the Collingwood Room at the Joint Services Command and Staff College, Shrivenham, on the 15th of July 2008. The speaker is Dr Gerald E. Brown, Associate Professor of Military History, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. I should preface my remarks by telling you that the reason that I have become interested in this topic is because it has become, over the last year at Leavenworth, a topic that has generated a tremendous amount of discussion, sometimes very um, emotional issues that fall out of this. About 60% of our students now have just returned from a tour in either Iraq or Afghanistan, and uh, many of them have come from units that have been engaged in direct combat, have lost soldiers, and that tends to both reinforce people's interest in these rules of engagement and also change their opinions and attitudes about the rules of engagement. And so this is something that we perhaps would not have been talking about four or five years ago, and perhaps before our current operations in Iraq would not have been a topic of discussion at all because everybody thought they knew what the rules were, everybody thought they knew how to apply the rules, and everybody thought they knew what they could expect from both ourselves and our uh, enemies. To give you just a few minutes of background, and I think it is important to go back and talk about the baggage that we carry because that is uh, very important when we talk about the current rules of engagement. Most of us, and I'm talking about my generation and those of you whose military experience goes back at least to the 1970s and some of us whose military experience goes back to the 1960s, were certainly influenced and came to believe what we do about military operations during the Cold War. There were good things about the Cold War and bad things. One thing that was good about the Cold War is that we knew our enemy. We knew how our enemy thought. We knew what we could expect from our enemy, and that included the rules of engagement. We had a shared sense of value, whether we particularly approved of them, with our enemies during the Cold War, and that informed, to a tremendous extent, our rules of engagement. Even after the fall of the Soviet Empire at the end of the 1980s, as we went into the 1990s, we carried those ideas and those values with us. I think that they were certainly vindicated during Desert Storm and following Desert Storm, we had no reason to challenge or to change our basic ideas about the rules of engagement. They had worked for us for a generation. They were well known. And it was relatively easy to plan operations without having to be overly concerned with a changing set of rules, not only from operation to operation, but sometimes from day to day. And even though during the 1980s and the 1990s, we experienced a series of events that perhaps were a portent of things to come, and I refer to such things as the uh, Beirut bombing of the Marine barracks, the Cobalt Towers, the various embassy bombings, the USS Cole, it was really seen more as an anomaly or an aberration rather than as a clear indication of where the future might lay. And therefore, there was no particular reason for us to rethink or to relook at our rules of engagement. It really wasn't until after 9-11 that we saw a clear indication that the future might have a different complexion than the past. And I'm not sure even now that we have fully grasped the consequences of that or what that means for the individual soldier in the field as he goes out every day to accomplish his mission and hopefully to survive. After 9-11, of course, we then plunged into both Afghanistan and subsequently into Iraq. But the initial planning and the perception of those operations were really more in terms of conventional concepts rather than that a new form of warfare was thrust upon us and that we needed to thoroughly rethink how we did business, why we did it, and how to prepare for it. Even our initial approach after 9-11 was vindicated by how successfully 
almost how easily we defeated the Iraqi army and overthrew Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq. This seemed to vindicate everything that we had done, both at the operational planning level, at the training level, at the development of the equipment that we were able to put in the field, and certainly in terms of using the long-standing set of rules which uh, we had developed over the previous generation. It wasn't until after the uh, fall of the Saddam regime and the surprise that we confronted suddenly when we see a uh, nascent uh, insurgency grow into a serious challenge in the field. And then, of course, the totally incapable government that we put in place in Iraq. It was not capable of taking control of the situation, controlling the country, and dealing with its own insurgents that we began to realize that maybe the situation had changed and maybe we needed to rethink the premise not only operationally but how we would interpret the new rules of engagement. Our soldiers were suddenly plunged into an environment for which they were not prepared and for which we were not prepared to prepare them. I think this is really the result of three areas that still vex us and perhaps will continue to do so well into the future. One, of course, is the legal nature of the whole issue of the rules of engagement. Who's to determine the rules of engagement? The operational commanders are the tactical commanders who must send their soldiers into harm's way every day. Are they to determine the rules of engagement? They have first-hand knowledge. They are closest to the situation. They are the immediate responsibility for everything that will happen both operationally and in terms of how their soldiers behave in the field. Are they to be the determinants of the, the rules? As a soldier myself, I would like to say yes, because they know things that cooler heads more distant from the theater can never know and can never understand. On the other hand, we know that they are not the source of the determinant of the rules of engagement. They are overseen not only by superior authorities who unfortunately, or perhaps appropriately as the situation today might be, people who bear a much greater degree of responsibility and, by the way, who are always concerned about the course of their careers. We know how easy it is for the career of a brigade or a division commander to go down the tube if either the inappropriate rules are applied or if one subordinate, even at a much lower level, violates those rules. It can be catastrophic for the career of mid or higher level commanders. Or, as we have increasingly found out in the course of the last five years during the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, during which time the situation has changed significantly from year to year, sometimes month to month, it may be the lawyers who determine what the rules of engagement are. And they can determine what the rules of engagement are, not by writing a manual, not by even writing out a set of rules that will be uniformly applied, but by uh, their actions either pursuing or choosing not to pursue issues raised by troops in the field. This is a persistent problem in our system, particularly in the U.S. Army, and I think to some extent perhaps lesser in the British Army, and that is the lawyers through their own interests can determine what the rules of engagement will be. We have seen a number of cases, particularly the Marines uh, at Haditha, who were all initially exonerated by their uh, operational command from any responsibility, but who were then subsequently brought uh, up on charges by the lawyers. And then, as you all know if you've just read the news in the last few days, the courts martial panels have exonerated all but one of those Marines who was involved in that incident. Well, what does this tell the average soldier about what is right, what is wrong, what is appropriate, what is inappropriate, and how is he to determine on the spur of the moment in the field when he perceives his life or the life of his comrades to be in jeopardy what he can and cannot do? It's a terribly vexing issue all the way down the chain of command. This issue of the rules of engagement 
not only may be in the hands of the lawyers who sometimes very subtly influence how the rules will be applied in the field, what rules will be applied or what rules will not be applied, but the role of the media in this cannot be overlooked. For example, the scandal with Abu Ghraib, which has influenced a lot of our thinking, both in terms of how we treat enemy prisoners and uh, the rules by which they will be held accountable, but the rules by which their wardens and uh, captors will be held accountable. This would never have become an issue if it weren't for the role of the modern media. Should we put into the hands of reporters who have finally and ultimately only their own careers and their accountability to their editors and publishers the hands of determining what is and what is not appropriate in combat situations? And by the way, I don't have a nice pat answer for that question. We want the media to be involved. It is to our benefit to have the media involved. In fact, in Iraq, for the first time, the U.S. military, and I believe by extension the British military, deliberately undertook a program to bring the media into the mainstream of the military by attaching accredited reporters with each headquarters and each combat battalion. This was done as a way of overcoming some of the deficiencies that we had experienced in previous wars where the military was accused of not being adequately covered, of not sharing information. And so we bent over backward to make sure that the media was uh, included by embedding these reporters throughout the military force at every level. Are they your friend or are they your enemy? I don't have a good answer to that question either, but I can tell you that the answer to that depends upon uh, where you stand throughout the military organization. Generally speaking, the higher level commanders were quite pleased with the level of reporting, with the stories that went out, and with the treatment that they received at the hands of most of the reporters who had been embedded. The lower the level you go, the more the commanders at battalion and company level And certainly the private soldiers were irritated, were disappointed, and ultimately came to see the presence of these reporters as a burden rather than as a positive asset. Partly because they perceived that uh, the media reporters who were attached to their units were often given special treatment. A media reporter, for whatever source he worked, always had the option at any time to opt out. If he felt uncomfortable, if he felt threatened, if he just got tired, he could simply say, I'm done, I want to go home. And arrangements would be made to relieve him and move him out of that position. The soldiers, on the other hand, were not in that enviable position. They were there for the duration of the war, if not for the duration of their designated tour, and they could not simply opt out. This created a certain amount of bad feeling between some of the reporters who chose not to stick to it and the soldiers who were there without the option of leaving. Some of the reports that reporters sent out were indeed positive, positive stories about what they were doing, positive stories that varied considerably from previous conflicts where the press sort of ran amok and was not necessarily embedded with specific units or able to uh, bond with particular soldiers or their units. The problem was, however, that the soldier always held the press in a certain level of suspicion. These guys could turn on you quickly. They could be writing a very positive story about you one day, but the next, if something went wrong, if there was an incident, if somebody made a mistake, That could be easily blown out of proportion. That could be easily presented to the world media in a very critical light. And the soldiers tended to remain quite suspicious of what the ultimate motives of the press might be. How many soldiers behaved in a different way because they knew there was a reporter right behind them, watching them with a camera or with some type of video equipment that could send an image back to a hometown television station in very short order? I don't know. I don't know if there's any way to determine that, but I do know that the very presence of reporters in combat units tended to influence the behavior of soldiers perhaps both positively and negatively. The other side of this issue, of course, then, 
is how do we train soldiers, particularly young soldiers, in an environment where they may or may not know from day to day what the specific rules of engagement are. They may not find it appropriate to conform to those rules because they perceive the situation is different. And you have to understand their perceptions, the perception of a soldier on the line, is always different than the perception of a staff officer, even uh, a public relations staff officer who is sitting back in a division or a corps headquarters who is checking off whether or not certain stories are appropriate. You can never know exactly what that soldier is thinking. How do you train that young soldier, be he a young lieutenant who has just been commissioned and is conducting his first assignment as a platoon leader, or whether he is a brigade or a division uh, public relations officer whose job it is to daily go before the press and answer questions and report on these incidents, how do you train these soldiers to deal with this ever-changing situation of the rules of engagement? Once again, I don't have a quick and easy answer for that question. I would like to say the best way to deal with that is to start your training at a very early stage of one's military career, which means today, of course, uh, starting with cadets in the military schools and preconditioning courses that we give officers. I would like to think that we could start there. The problem is, as any training officer will tell you, and I know a lot of you have filled that role, the plate is already full. You already have more things to prepare this young would-be officer for than you have time, and something has to give way, perhaps something that can be put off until considerable time in the future, such as preparing them for public relations roles, is something that is not very pressing. We realized now in 2003-2004 uh, at Leavenworth in our course that most of our officers were woefully prepared to deal with these critical issues. Not only did they not understand the rules of engagement, and many of my officers who have come back from either Iraq or Afghanistan and some who have been in other deployments equally as vexatious have talked about the fact that they didn't even know sometimes what the rules of engagement were for that particular day when they would send their soldiers out for a patrol or a sweep in the morning. We developed a very interesting way of dealing with this, and that is we would have cards printed with different sets of rules on them. There would be a green card, a blue card, or a yellow card, and you would hand the appropriate card out to the squad leader or to the uh, platoon leader, as he was getting ready to leave on his particular mission for the day so he would know what the rules are. So what time does he have then to communicate those uh, rules for the day to his soldiers? And the answer is sometimes he's the only one who knows what the rules are. And this could literally change from day to day, depending upon what type of mission you are on, depending upon what the intelligence had just brought in about the latest situation in the area, depending upon what I hate to say it, what the mood of the command is on the day. And this would be something that would cause uh, innumerable problems, and many of my returning students would talk about the fact that the rules are not only hazy, sometimes they're so mushy that you can't even get your fingers around them. How do you train staff officers? By the way, most of our officers leaving our course at Leavenworth will go to serve on staffs. They will not command uh, battalions or brigades, only a few of them. Perhaps as few as one-fifth of our uh, graduating students will ever actually command a battalion or a brigade, but uh, they will almost all go to work on staffs. And so our basic solution is you have to, first of all, train the staff to be able to understand, to be responsive to, and to be able to answer for the application of the rules of engagement. This, of course, implies that even the higher-level commands know what they are and can communicate them. And we have worked extremely hard at Leavenworth in uh, training soldiers on the various rules of engagement. They not only need to know what the rules are, which is very important, they need to know why those rules have been put in place. And sometimes that means that they have to take considerably advanced effort to find out for themselves. They will not necessarily have somebody come and tell them why. They have to self-educate themselves. And we've spent a lot of time working on that process. 
they need to first of all know the historical antecedents of roots of the rules of engagement. As I pointed out, we had an entire generation of military professionals who understood the rules of engagement because they didn't change significantly and because the enemy didn't change. Not only do the rules change, the enemy changes and the enemy's culture changes frequently. We've talked a lot about cultural sensitivity and how to apply those rules to different cultures. Well, what happens if you're working in certain areas in Iraq is you can be surrounded by two or sometimes three different ethnic religious groups simultaneously, which means you have to be prepared to deal with each of those groups separately with a separate set of rules. Is this overburdening the current commander who must confront the situation? I would like to think not. I would like to think that our current generation of officers are not only smart enough, they are better educated than many of their predecessors, and they are therefore better able to deal with these situations. But I have no evidence to support that, and I couldn't guarantee you that that is the situation. What I do know that as we deal with a series of irregular enemies, each of whom have their own sets of objectives, goals, and perceptions of the future, and each of which will apply their own sets of rules of engagement, we have to be responsive to that. First of all, we have to be responsive to that because it's our obligation to serve our soldiers and to make sure that they have full understanding of what is happening and why we are looking after them. But second of all, because we do have this ever-changing legal system which reinterprets the rules and reinterprets the procedures from month to month and certainly from year to year, and because we are going to, at least as far mm -hmm. into the future as I can see, be looked at very carefully by the media, which, by the way, is probably more prepared for you to make a mistake and to report it than for you to, to do something brilliant and get credit for it. And I see that what it implies for those of us who teach prospective staff officers is we have to keep ourselves better prepared and better educated because otherwise we cannot convince them that it is their responsible not to always take our lead but to educate themselves about these, these issues. The problem, as you all know, because it's a problem that faces all of us, the amount of literature that is being produced today on virtually every issue of warfare is uh, growing exponentially. There was a time when I would be able to find one appropriate publication in a professional journal on the rules of engagement, have all of my students read it, and then three or four months later refer back to it. Today, the plethora of published material means that I have a choice every day of four or five new professional articles to have my students read just on that one topic of the rules of engagement, let alone all the other areas of uh, insurgency warfare. As you all know, have just published our newest doctrinal manual, 23-1 on in, uh, insurgency warfare, actually the product of General Petraeus while he was the commandant at Leavenworth. Already that is being outdated, surprisingly enough. Manuals don't last for a generation like they used to. They become outdated almost before the ink is dried. And there are already several new theories being put forth on how we should revise our doctrine of counterinsurgency. Part of that, of course, implies a reassessment and a reevaluation of our rules of engagement. Dr. Brown answered two questions. Question one Your assessment of the involvement of lawyers is the creation of rules of engagement. But in the UK forces, the role of a lawyer to an operational commander is to write justifications to liberalise his ROEs to provide more freedom of action, and also to advise if the ROEs are consistent with the mission, the political direction and international law. Do you feel that there's a different approach in the US? Well, I think at the operational level, let's say the brigade level, for sake of argument, the brigade staff judge advocate fills two different positions. One is, of course, advisor to the commander. And that often is one of those positions that the commander has very little time to consult. Usually these operations are done on a very short notice. There are usually a, a number of extenuating circumstances why it, it can't be put off, why it has to be done quickly. 
And the other part of that is that in his staff, the judge advocate is not generally considered all that important. He has to deal with his operational commanders. He has to deal with his planners. He has to deal with his logistics. And usually the judge advocate's somewhere down the list in terms of being consulted. And the other, then, is the role of the judge advocate in that unit to respond to questions or charges against individuals for misconduct. Now, are you friend or foe? And sometimes the perception is different whether you're one of those subordinate commanders who may now be put on the carpet for some incident or whether you are higher in the chain of command who wants to see that everything is done with great circumspect. And the question sometimes is, whose side are you on? And that is not always clear, as I say. It's it's often a a case of the perception. As you know, in the case of the Marine incident in Aditha, the Marine judge advocate originally said that there was nothing wrong. Well, now he has himself been singled out for treatment because his actions was viewed as a cover-up. He did not pursue a vigorous investigation. He was not willing to bring charges, even though other lawyers from a higher command later on determined that charges were appropriate, although all of those individuals, with the exception of one, have now been exonerated. So where do you come in that press between your responsibility to your commander, your obligation to your profession as a lawyer to to see that the, the guilty are punished and the innocent are exonerated, and the pressure that comes from above, because the service is always concerned today about the perception of the media and the worst word that you can be charged with is cover-up. I don't know exactly where you personally come in that. But it is, it's a persistent problem that I think we're not likely to get beyond as long as our current system is in place. Question two. The UK's excursions into peacekeeping operations during the 1990s created a generation of soldiers who were hesitant to open fire, and it has taken a lot of work by lawyers and the chain of command to give them the confidence to open fire. Was it the same in the US? Well, I think that was perhaps common from, say, the mid-1970s until the 1990s. Soldiers were taught to be very uh, cautious. They were always told, you have the right to defend yourself. You have the right to return fire. Well, there's a big difference between returning fire once somebody has already fired upon you and preemptive fire when you see a situation developing. This, of course, was one of the problems of Mogadishu, and I know most of you have either read the book or seen the movie Black Hawk Down, and these were some of our best trained, some of our most skilled soldiers, and confronted in the streets with a large number of civilians, many of whom were women, they were very reluctant to open fire. And then, of course, by the time they did finally open fire, they were quickly overwhelmed because the enemy by that time had gotten too close and they they simply didn't have the ability to resist the large number of people that were confronting them in the streets. What would have been different if they had been more prepared to fire at a greater distance or to call in firepower, call in support much earlier? believing that that they were following the then established rules of engagement, that is, you fired when fired upon. And from the standpoint of, once again, go back to that 19 or 20-year-old soldier who probably has not been in the Army more than 12 or 14 months, and even though you've given him this training lecture about the rules of engagement, what has he been taught his whole life? What values does he bring with him to that besides the military training that he's received? One is he's probably never actually shot at a real person before. And second of all, his cultural upbringing, particularly in our culture, has been one of value human life. You don't kill people. This is embedded in our religion, in our culture, in our training of of our young citizens. And now you're putting him in a situation where he has to make an instantaneous decision. And even in the case, as I pointed out, in the Mogadishu incident, with very, very skillful soldiers, they didn't react soon enough. I don't know if you use that as a part of your training scenario here, but we use that at Leavenworth repeatedly. And we have come to the conclusion that the problem is it wasn't that they ultimately chose to open fire, even against this mob of civilians, but they waited too long. Please note, any views expressed in this presentation are entirely and solely those of the author, and do not necessarily reflect official thinking and policy of Her Majesty's Government, the Ministry of Defence, 
or the U.S. Army. Dr. Brown can be contacted by email at gerald.brown at conus, spelt Charlie Oscar November Uniform Sierra, dot army dot mill. Thank you.